Hey everybody. In this video we're going to take on a question from Mark in Brighton, New York. And Mark writes, Dear Q&A Ted, what does it mean to have a personal relationship with Jesus? And how does one have this? Your homeboy, Mark. Mark, I do believe that's the best question we've received yet. So first of all, thank you. I notice there are two questions in your email. First, what does it mean to have a personal relationship with Jesus? And second, how does one have this? So I'm going to tackle both your questions in this video in sequence. But before I do that, I want to answer a potential objection, which believe it or not, I have actually heard from actual people and not just on the internet. And that is an objection to the phrase personal relationship with Jesus, which in some ears sounds like Protestant language and so not appropriate for us as Catholics. That is nonsense, which I will now demonstrate by calling as witness Pope Benedict XVI. Christianity is not a new philosophy or a new morality. We are only Christians if we encounter Christ in reading sacred scripture, in prayer, in the liturgical life of the church. We can touch Christ's heart and feel him touching ours. Only in this personal relationship with Christ, only in this encounter with the risen one, do we truly become Christians. Did you get that? Only in a personal relationship with Christ do we truly become Christians. And that's the reason I'm so excited to make this video, because this is our faith. It seems to me there are two ways people in the world today tend to think about our Lord. On the one hand, some see him as distant, imposing, a judgmental figure, the embodiment of austere authority. Others think of Jesus meek and mild, traipsing Bambi-like through the meadows of Palestine. This Jesus is your pal. He accepts you just the way you are. Now, this is an important question because the contour of the relationship depends on what Christ is to us. On the one hand, if Christ is above and we're below, then a relationship with that Christ is gonna be master-slave, right? On the other hand, a Christ who's down here on our level a relationship with that Christ is going to be friend-friend, pal-pal. So it seems like an either-or, Christ as master or Christ as friend. Sinners in the hands of an angry God or buddy Christ. So what's it to be? I would suggest that as Catholics, we render an answer that has a long history in our intellectual tradition, and that is to refuse the dichotomy and instead say both and. Christ is both master and friend. Which is a bold claim. I mean, to embrace a contradiction like this is to expose ourselves to the charge of irrationality. So on what possible basis can we justify saying this? I want to take you to the Last Supper discourse in the Gospel of John. John 13.13 13. You call me teacher and master, and you are right, for so I am. John 15.15 15. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. There you have it, staring right up at you from the page in black and white. But what does it mean? So in John 13, Christ calls himself teacher and master, meaning he is above us, both in knowledge and in power. So there's inequality, which to some ways of thinking is intolerable because an imbalance of power leads necessarily to oppression and injustice. One solution to this problem and you see this quite frequently in biblical studies, is to drag Christ down to our level and make him our equal. 
as a mere prophet or sage or religious teacher, Christ no longer poses the threat that he poses when he's God. So Christ explicitly names the problem, if you want to call it that. He says, in effect, yes, I am above you. Yes, I am master to you. But the solution he offers to his apostles at the Last Supper and through them to us is of a different nature entirely. He offers to lift them into relationship with him through obedience to his new commandment, to love one another as he has loved us. When we become friends to Christ, as his apostles did, it doesn't erase the fact that he's God and we're not, but it does prevent that imbalance of power separating us from him in any meaningful way. In other words, it ceases to be a problem. It's just no longer relevant that he is above and we're below when Christ is in us and we in him. Any division there once was is dissolved in the love we share. This may not make a whole lot of sense looking in from the outside, but the relationship we're talking about here is kind of like a stained glass window in that you can only fully appreciate it standing inside the church. And speaking from the inside of this relationship, I have experienced the friendship of the Lord, whom I also call my master, and it is good. And although choosing either or seems from the outside more logically defensible, neither option really works in practice. So if you choose only God as master, you're left with a religion that's cold and empty, like a, a skeleton in a classroom. Your religion is a list of rules without any reason to obey them. If, on the other hand, you choose only God as friend, you're left with a puddle of saccharine sentimentality, like a body without a skeleton, kind of squishy and lacking any definite form. Our relationship with Christ needs to be founded on the bedrock truth that he is indeed God and we are in fact not. But his transcendence becomes less terrifying and ceases to be a barrier to intimacy when we also recognize his all-surpassing love. So great that he laid down his life for us and called us his friends. See, Christ is our master and our teacher, but he's also our friend. And once you try this relationship out and see it in action, believe me, you'll quickly see that there's no contradiction. That, in short, is the answer to your first question. What does it mean to have a personal relationship with Jesus? It means obeying him as master and loving him as friend. In fact, that's our Lord's own answer in the Last Supper discourse in John. And it's also the pattern of life lived out by myself and by so many other Christians. And we can testify firsthand that this is not just pretty words. This really works. Now on to your next question. How do you have that? And Mark, that is a really good question. Because we all know how relationships work, right? You communicate, you do things for each other, you spend time together. That's what a relationship is. But how do you have that with Christ, who, if you haven't noticed, is now in heaven? So let's take those one at a time. How do you communicate? How do you do things for each other? How do you spend time together? So first, how do you communicate with Christ? And the answer to that question, in a word, is prayer, which is absolutely essential to the Christian life. I remember a conversation I had once with a very fine bishop uh, out in Iowa, who said that from time to time over the course of his Episcopal career, one of his priests would come in to him asking to be laicized because he'd lost his vocation. And the bishop would say to the man, when did you stop praying? And he always had. So prayer is the way that we communicate with Christ. And for a Christian, it's a matter of life and death. How then does Christ communicate with you? 
I'm going to mention three ways here. First, and this is kind of extraordinary and unusual, but it does happen. God does communicate with man miraculously by his spirit. So sometimes there are loud miracles that a lot of people hear about, like uh, Our Lady at Fatima. At other times, there are quiet miracles, private miracles, like a profound feeling of peace when you finally arrived at a decision on something you've been praying about for a long time. Again, this is not the usual way that God communicates with man, and only a very foolish or immature person would demand of God that he appear and answer your questions on your terms. That's not going to happen. Ours is not the kind of God that jumps through hoops. However, we Catholics do believe in miracles, and we refuse to put God on a leash or tell him what he can and can't do as though that would do any good. Because if God wants to talk to somebody, he's going to do it. Just make sure that it is God that you're hearing. As a wise man once said, the saints are those who least confuse their own voice with God's. The usual way God communicates with us is by his word. Actually, I just made a video on this. There's a way of reading scripture called Lectio Divina that engages scripture, not with your mind, not like in a Bible study, but as an act of prayer to hear it as God's word to you. So that is the usual way that we hear back from Christ when we've communicated with him by prayer. In the words of St. Ambrose, we speak to him when we pray, we listen to him when we read the divine oracles. So those two things, prayer and the word of God, are what keep your relationship with Christ alive. That is the main line of communication. It's like, it's like breathing, right? You breathe in the word of God, you breathe out your prayer. In the words of Pope Benedict, if the lungs of prayer and of the word of God do not nourish the breath of our spiritual life, we risk being overwhelmed by countless everyday things. Prayer is the breath of the soul and of life. I also want to mention a third way of hearing God, and that is through other people, and especially fellow Christians. That's why Christian community and fellowship are so important to the Christian life, because one of the ways we hear God is in the mouths of our fellows, in fraternal encouragement and correction, or in spiritual direction and mentorship. Find an older man or woman of faith who's walked with God and acquired wisdom, and disclose yourself to them and take counsel. Because one of the ways God communicates with us is through the medium of our fellow man. As you get better acquainted with salvation history, you're going to see this pattern again and again and again. That God delights in using human beings to do his work on earth. And I would suggest the reason for this is very simply his love for us. He wants to lift human beings to the astonishing honor and dignity of being his agents in the world. He doesn't want to work around you. He wants to work in you and through you. And when you realize that, realize that we're not just saying that God communicates with you through other people, although that's certainly true. We're also saying that God is going to use you to communicate with other people. So that, in a nutshell, is how communication works in our relationship with Christ. What about doing things for each other? First, I want to take you back to Genesis chapter 1, to that all-important verse about the creation of mankind. Remember, what God said was, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. What that means is that we humans are image bearers. We are icons of God on two feet. Here in the West, we tend not to talk about the theology of icons and the Seventh Ecumenical Council as much as our brethren do in the Eastern churches. So let me just briefly explain it to you. An icon is, very simply, an image, like of a saint or a gospel event. This is an icon of the Transfiguration that is intended to be transparent, 
to the thing depicted. Hence the practice of venerating icons of saints and worshiping icons of our Lord. Which to some, like certain Protestants, looks like rank idolatry. But what you've got to realize is that an act of worship paid to an icon doesn't terminate in the image. This is not an idol. It's like a window through which those of us who live in the 21st century can reach back through the millennia and kiss the feet of Christ. Now think back to Genesis chapter 1. You and I, we human beings, are made in God's image and likeness. We are icons of God. It's easy to lose sight of this, since we humans have an awful lot to do with other humans, so that seeing another human is hardly an occasion for wonder or reverence or religious transport. But, as C.S. Lewis said in Weight of Glory, next to the Blessed Sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. So we should strive to recover a sense of reverence toward the image of God in our neighbor, and to live in such a way as to make it easier for him to see the image of God in us. Let's bring this back around to our question. How do we do things for Christ? So if that human over there is an icon, is a sort of a window, then it means that things you do to him don't terminate in the man, but go on through to Christ. As our Lord himself said in Matthew 25, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger and welcome thee, or naked and clothe thee? And when did we see thee sick or in prison and visit thee? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. So I would argue that the main way that we do things for Christ is through the medium of other human beings. But there's also another way of doing things for Christ, and that is by offering sacrifices. The practice of offering sacrifices to God goes all the way back to the Old Testament, when, for instance, Israel was permitted to enter into the presence of all holy God to offer animal sacrifices, like, for instance, a burnt offering or a thanksgiving offering, first at the tabernacle in the wilderness and then in the temple. And the Torah calls these offerings a pleasing fragrance to the Lord. Now, why is that? A sacrifice is not pleasing because God loves the smell of roasting meat, nor is it because God is hungry and needs us to feed him. Our sacrifices are pleasing to God in much the same way parents are pleased to receive a gift from their child, even though they know at the end of the day Everything the child has came from them. Now, Christians today don't offer up animal sacrifices to God, since as we read, for instance, in the book of Hebrews, the sacrificial economy of ancient Israel is no longer in force. But we do still offer up sacrifices to God. For instance, in almsgiving, in vigils, in fasts, in offering up our sufferings, and most of all, in sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. Because even though all we have is from God and belongs ultimately to him, he's pleased by our gifts and receives them like a loving parent. So that's how we do things for Christ. How then does Christ do things for us? <laughs> I can't, can't help but laugh because he just does. He's faithful and he's going to give you everything that you need, both consolations and hardships. Just don't worry about his keeping up his end of the bargain. Our task is to try to train our vision so that we can see all things as coming from him and learn to respond accordingly. So 
to endure suffering in patient obedience and to receive his gifts with humble thanksgiving. For from him and through him and to him are all things. And let me just note something that's perhaps not immediately obvious. Even the good things that we do that turn out well are gifts from God. And so we offer thanks. I remember back when I was in high school, my best friend was agnostic. And he was very perceptive, and he loved figuring out how things work. And one day he called me out, and he said, I've been watching you, and whenever you do something wrong, it's your fault. But whenever you do something right, you refuse to take any credit, and you just say, it was all thanks to God. And I said, yes, that is exactly right. You get it. They're Christians who take years and years to figure that out. But even the things that we ourselves do that turn out well, we receive them as gifts from God and we give thanks. On the topic, though, of doing things for each other, I want to mention a special way that God does things for us Christians, and that is through the seven sacraments. Special because God binds himself by dominical promises to convey grace through matter. Things like water and oil, bread and wine, the imposition of hands, and the spoken word. So for instance, when you baptize somebody, we believe that the person actually changes. Something actually happens. The person's sins are really forgiven because God acts through the water on that human soul which, if you think about it, is supremely comforting for us as humans, right? Because it's kind of hard to know whether you're saved or not. I mean, you may feel saved one moment, and then the next, you feel kind of unsure. And you start thinking to yourself, maybe I should go up at another altar call, or maybe I should repray the sinner's prayer. It's all kind of muddy with baptism there's nothing to be unsure about. It cuts right through the feelings. Did you get wet? Yes? Good, you're a Christian. Now, I'm not saying that interior disposition is unimportant or that God acts on the human person from the outside without that person's cooperation or consent. What I'm saying is that God provides in the sacraments objective reference points by which we can be sure that he has touched us. Because God knows we humans are made of matter. And so he condescends to work through material things. So that's how Christ does things for us. Next, how do we spend time together with him? First and foremost, if you're blessed to live somewhere near a church that has adoration, take advantage of that. What is adoration? Adoration is you go into the chapel and they have the Holy Eucharist there in a monstrance, exposed so that you can see it with your eyes. And very simply, you sit or kneel, and you gaze on him, and you love him. And what does it do for you? It's like Paul says in 2 Corinthians, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Do you want that? and go to adoration. And if you haven't got adoration nearby, then get your friends together and bother your priest till he gives it to you. There really is nothing like it. There would be no St. Irenaeus Ministries if our founder hadn't spent many, many hours in front of the Blessed Sacrament in adoration. There are also forms of prayer designed specifically for spending time with God, like meditation, and I don't mean New Age meditation where you empty yourself out. I mean, that's, that's just an invitation to demons. I mean Christian meditation, where you fill yourself up with the holy things of God and focus your mind on them. Or contemplation, which is to savor God's goodness in quiet solitude. Spending time with Christ in this way is also a form of sacrifice, especially if you're like me and feel like you have to cram every waking moment full of activity. It's difficult just to sit in the presence of God. But do it. 
Offer him that sacrifice. Pour out your time like a libation before the Lord, and the Lord will see it and be pleased. So to summarize, what does it mean to have a personal relationship with Jesus? It means letting him be to you both a master and a friend. And how does one have this relationship? Now, it's true that you can't communicate with Christ or do things for each other or spend time together in quite the same way you do in your other relationships. But you can communicate with him by praying. And he can and does communicate with us by his spirit, through his word and in our fellow man, and especially our fellow Christians. You can do things for him by offering him sacrifices and by loving your neighbor in practical ways. He does things for you by, well, by everything that he does for you, and in a special way by the sacraments. And you can spend time together in meditation, contemplation, and above all, adoration of the Holy Eucharist. What we're talking about here is coming to know Christ and to know his ways. And so you sanctify your vision. It's like it says in that cryptic verse in Matthew, if your eye is sound, your whole body will be full of light. So part of your work as a Christian is to train your eye so that you see the hand of Christ in all things, and so that you hear his word in the scriptures and in the stillness of your heart, and so that you recognize him in your neighbors, so that through them you can act on the love that you feel in your heart toward Christ. The relationship that we're talking about here is not the sort of thing that just happens in an instant. It's something that needs to be grown into. It's kind of like a, a journey. But fortunately for us, we don't walk this road alone. We can take aid and counsel from those who've gone before, and encouragement from our fellows who walk alongside. And above all, we have Christ himself walking with us every step of the way, because he wants to gather you to himself. He wants you to be like his beloved disciple, reclining on his bosom, because he loves you. And this relationship is worth all the time and effort that you can put into it. It is the single most important thing that you can do with your life. Thanks for watching.